Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. And today we have two great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, the company loses a million dollars because they don't want to pay people. The second story, operator of the company wanted to talk to my sister, who is deaf on the phone. Don't you see anything wrong? And the first story is, give me a raise or replace me. Almost a decade ago, I worked in a call center doing over the phone tech support. I worked there for almost seven years until I was fired because the desk phone they issued me malfunctioned for six weeks straight, despite my continued twice a week complaints. They didn't even try to appeal my unemployment either. Anyway, I started there in 2008, and by 2010 I had switched from a customer service role to a tech support role, and then moved into a senior tech support role, which did not come with extra pay. My job consisted primarily of calling customers back who had an issue that normal tech support was unable to resolve. If I had time, I was expected to help call back customers who left dissatisfied surveys as well. I was also given certain blocks of time during the week to monitor the interdepartmental chat room to help answer questions. I also had a lot of documentation to do to keep track of everything I did and said to a customer. I take pride in my work. Once I learned the ins and outs of the system, I became rather competitive. Each survey or escalation had an associated ticket. We were expected to close 60 tickets per month per person. This equated to just under three per day. In order to close a ticket, we either had to resolve their issue or at least note their additional survey feedback, escalate their issue to the corporate office, to die, more on that later, or leave three voicemails over three days and send them an email. Once I was comfortable with what I was doing, my goal became not to close the most tickets, but to absolutely destroy everyone else and how many I got done. The minimum was 60 per month, and there were a couple of people in our 12-person department who never broke 100 and were normally doing 50 to 70 a month. Most people were in the 100 to 200 range, a few sometimes getting up to 250. I regularly did 400 or more every month for almost three years. I had days where I would make 75 phone calls a day. I also monitored the chat room, often more than required, wrote articles for our internal database, helped our slowest members with paperwork, answered incoming frontline emails if they were behind, and had low-level agents directly transfer live customers to me, rather than escalating them, if I knew I could resolve their issue right away. Towards the end of that three years, I also began helping out another department that dealt with customers who mailed their device in for repair. It wasn't that I was so much smarter than everyone or ridiculously good at troubleshooting, I'm just organized and driven. When we had a slow month where almost nobody called us at all, I only did 125 tickets and read probably seven hours a day. I read Stephen King's Dark Tower series in a week, entirely at work. The company I worked for, the one who signed my paychecks, was a contract company owned by a big multinational out of Canada. They took contracts from companies like DirecTV, Comcast, and USAA. I found out that the company I was doing contracted work for paid my company $35 an hour for my time, but I only saw $10.50 of that. I also was almost never allowed overtime, maybe one to two weeks a year for the entire seven years. First level leaders were salaried, and if they didn't work any overtime, made about $12.70. I heard that the next level leader made about $60,000 a year, and the building director doubled that. The company that made the product I was troubleshooting was like a dumpster fire. They sold a product that developed a hardware issue, which they knew was a hardware issue, but they forbid us from telling a customer that, and instead told them that we were working on a software update. Despite being primarily in the USA, our website only offered user manuals in Spanish, and the website developer claimed that it was impossible to add a new tab for user manuals to the website. A coworker recoded the website, hosting new pages on a personal server and linking every outside link, like to another part of the website, in just 45 minutes and presented it to our corporate office. Our warranty only allowed for repair. We would not ship out a replacement device and would not provide any sort of loaner device. Minimum repair time was three weeks and the customer was responsible for shipping the device in, including paying for shipping in a box. If it got lost on the way, it wasn't our problem. Apparently, our repair center decided that first in, first out wasn't a convenient system for processing the repairs, so they just pulled however they felt like it. I had the pleasure of calling customers who had mailed their device in over a year prior because it wouldn't even power on to tell them that it was now out of warranty and we no longer had any parts to repair it anyway, and would they like us to mail it back to them? Now comes the malicious compliance. The first came in when the company tried to launch an in-house made data backup server. 
It was extremely poorly developed and failed miserably. Much better and free systems existed, and even if the company's system had worked flawlessly, it had no benefits that I could see. When we started receiving complaints that it was not working, our corporate office told us to just immediately escalate to them, don't even troubleshoot. I knew nothing was ever going to come of that, of letting cases just trickle in. I knew that corporate would just let them die. So I came in one day and I took all the pending cases for issues with the backup service and entered them into the ticket service program. Now this is where it got really good. At the time when you created a ticket, it would send you three emails by the time you had finished. That's before leaving notes or closing it, just entering information. I knew this, and I knew I could change the responsible person on the ticket from myself to the person at corporate in charge of this issue, at the beginning, instead of assigning it to them at the end. I entered 128 tickets for that issue alone that night. I was working second shift at the time. It only took me a few hours. I had plenty of time to do real work after that. That means the person at corporate who was supposed to handle these cases came into work the next day with over 350 new emails in their inbox. When I got to work the following day, I was told we were no longer escalating those issues and instead just telling customers that we were working on fixing it. Those customers never got called back and the person at corporate later lost their job because they barely ever got anything done. My last malicious compliance came when they started letting people work from home. They did this to save on operating costs as they expanded the workforce. By moving associates to work from home, this was 2012, they didn't have to pay for electricity or as much bandwidth, etc. If you worked from home, you were issued a terminal and keyboard and mouse and a phone. You had to supply a monitor and the system was a virtual machine. When an opportunity came up to switch to work from home, I put in for it. They moved people in groups as they purchased new equipment. When they found out that I wanted to work from home, they tried to talk me out of it because I wouldn't be able to do escalations and surveys at home. I would have to be frontline tech support again. I asked if I could have a raise then. I was already topped out and knew I would never get a raise ever. They said no, so I chose to work from home. My main reason for working from home was actually money. I didn't get a pay cut and I was spending a lot of money on gas because I lived 25 miles from work and gas was over $4 a gallon at the time. Working from home was like a 50 cent an hour raise because I was spending $20 a week on gas. Working from home was also great for me because I could work in my pajamas and didn't waste over an hour driving to and from work. I never understood why they wouldn't let me do what I had been doing before from home. I had all the same tools at home in the call center. When I left my old department to work from home, I was doing at least 25% of the work for the entire department. I was closing 400 and 500 tickets a month and still wasting an hour or two every day. They ended up needing to move three people into the department to replace me. I stayed with the company for three years after that, mostly because the work was easy and I wasn't particularly motivated to find something better. I ended up getting fired in the end. Like I said, they issued me a desk phone. It was like a landline phone, but had an LCD screen with some configurable options on it, and you could plug in a headset, and it worked over the internet. About six weeks before I got fired, my phone started having an issue where it would drop calls. Normally it would ring and you would press answer, but it started having an issue where it would ring once, or half a ring, or sometimes no ring at all, and then hang up on the customer. Sometimes it would then place me in a state where I couldn't take calls again, until I pressed a button on the phone. I notified my supervisor immediately when it first happened and continued to do so twice a week over the next two weeks. Despite my repeated complaints, I was told to just watch it and she refused to send me out a replacement. A week before I was fired, I was working on a day when my supervisor was not. A different supervisor saw that I was in this unavailable state and despite me telling him that it was my desk phone and that it had been happening for weeks, insisted on giving me a formal verbal warning. When my supervisor came in the next day, she immediately called me and told me she was upgrading my verbal warning to a final written warning. The company, like many, had a four-step system of verbal, written, final warning, and then terminated. She gave no reason for why she was upgrading it to a final written. A few days later, I noticed that one of my tools was not working correctly, but managed to struggle through until lunchtime when I restarted my terminal. After lunch, when I restarted, I was unable to log back in. I immediately texted my boss. We had to clock out for lunch. I didn't want to be in more trouble, and I didn't want to be underpaid either. I then called our help desk, but I was back on second shift, so it was after hours support and they were unable to help me. It was a Friday night and they said that normal help desk personnel wouldn't be available until Monday morning. I hung up and called my boss instead. It went to voicemail. I continued to try to reach out to my boss Saturday, Sunday, and Monday via text, phone, and email. I had been scheduled to work all weekend. I normally had days off in the middle of the week, but couldn't do so as I was unable to log into my terminal or phone. Monday morning I called the help desk again and I was told that I wasn't part of the company anymore, but there was no reason listed as to why and there was obviously nothing they could do to ask the help desk. 
My boss finally reached out to me on Wednesday via text and said that I had been fired for call avoidance. I filed for unemployment. It was denied, but when I appealed, the company didn't even have someone call in for the phone interview, so I won by default. I was on unemployment for six weeks before starting at my current job. Since then, I've gotten two promotions, and I'm currently making more than double what I made at my old job. To top it all off, last year the company lost a class action lawsuit for making people sign into their terminals and open software before clocking in. They didn't want to pay people for those five or so minutes a day, and they lost millions of dollars. I got a check for a few hundred bucks out of it, which was a nice touch. The next story is… Sorry, I have to speak with the account holder. This story actually happened to my sister. We'll call her Amanda. A few years ago, there was a big sporting event my family all wanted to get together and watch. We decided to all get together in my sister's house to watch it. She needed to upgrade her TV package to include more sports channels, which she was able to do online on the TV provider's website. Great. We had a great day. Watched the big event and ate and drank too much. The issue started when my sister went to cancel the subscription, so as to not keep paying the higher rate for future months. Apparently, while you can upgrade your package and give the company more money online, removing the package was much more difficult, of course. They said the only way to cancel the package was over the phone. My sister is deaf. So, needless to say, this was an issue. My sister had been emailing and complaining to no avail. At the time this happened, my brother was temporarily staying with my sister, and he called the company for her. The exchange apparently went like this. I'm relaying what my sister and brother told me. Brother. Hi, I need to cancel the subscription to Extra Sports for Amanda's second name. Woman, I'll need to speak with Amanda. Brother, my sister's deaf. She can't speak with you over the phone. Woman, there's nothing I can do. I have to speak with the account holder if you want to cancel your subscription. Brother, you need to speak with a deaf person on the phone. Woman, yes. Brother, and you don't see anything wrong with your current system? Woman, all changes have to be done by the account holder. Brother, yes, exactly. And the only reason this was set up was because she was able to make changes online. You're saying she can't reverse the changes. Woman, all I can tell you is I have to speak with Amanda. At this point, my brother was telling my sister what was being said, and they came up with a perfect solution. Brother, okay, one second. This is Amanda. My brother continued speaking, and it's worth noting that he has quite a deep husky voice. Woman, uh, brother, I need to cancel my sports subscription. Woman, I think you're the person I was just speaking to. Brother, no, I'm Amanda. You said you needed to speak with me? Woman, I thought you were deaf. Brother, and yet you insisted on speaking with me on the phone. So here I am. Please cancel my subscription. I have all the information you need to verify my identity. The subscription got cancelled. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.